All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Linda Eels, and I am the curator at the Johnny Christian House Samara in West Lafayette, Indiana. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in um, 1954, and it is a Usonian style home as opposed to the Prairie style. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. How do I get to the next? Just click on the bottom. There's a little arrow, or just click on the actual slide. Got it. Okay. So Frank Lloyd Wright was born in 1867. That is two years after the American Civil War ended. And he died in 1959, which is two years after Sputnik was launched. So I always like to think of his lifetime as having gone from buggies to spaceships. He was born in Richland Center, Wisconsin. His family moved around a lot when he was a young man, and that was basically because his father couldn't hold down a job. He'd been a preacher, he'd been a schoolmaster, he'd been a postmaster, he did all these different jobs. And when Wright turned about 18 years old, his mother got fed up and divorced his father, at which time Frank Lincoln Wright, as he was born, changed his name to Frank Lloyd Wright. And that was in order to honor his mother's family, the Lloyd Joneses, which were a force to be reckoned with in that Richland Center Spring Green area of Wisconsin. They were known as the God Almighty Lloyd Joneses, and they were all from Wales. They even had a family motto, truth against the world. Yeah. So he never graduated from high school. He went to the University of Wisconsin as a special student, spent a couple of semesters there learning engineering. And when he left, I'm sure he must have thought, I have learned everything these professors have to teach me in two short semesters. He was somewhat arrogant even back then, absolutely. So he leaves the University of Wisconsin and he goes to Chicago and he gets a job with a family friend and he spends about six months there learning how to be a draftsman. And then he gets a job at the most prestigious firm at the turn of the last, last century, which is Adler and Sullivan. And Louis Sullivan is known as the father of the skyscraper. Um, he works for Sullivan for about six years during which time he gets married and they have lots of children very quickly. And Wright always needs money. And it doesn't help that he had a philosophy that said, if you take care of the luxuries, the necessities will follow. I'll let that sink in for a minute. So Wright started doing designs for his neighbors in the Oak Park area where his home was. And when Sullivan found out about it, of course, he had to fire him because all the work is supposed to come through the firm, right? Well, Wright wasn't the least bit bothered by that. He just built a studio right next to his home there in Oak Park, which is why it's called the Home and Studio, hung out his shingle and became an architect all on his own. And everything went great until 1909 when there was a scandal and Wright left the country and went to Europe. He spent a couple of years in Europe and then he came back to the Oak Park area thinking everything will have blown over. Well, it didn't. Nobody wanted anything to do with Frank Lloyd Wright. So then he goes to Chicago thinking that'll be far enough away. It wasn't. So then he goes back to the land of his ancestors, back to that Spring Green Richland Center area of Wisconsin, and he builds a home there and he calls it Taliesin. And Taliesin is, Taliesin is Welsh for shining brow. So he's still trying to uh, appeal to those rather wealthy relatives. So he waits for business to come in and no business comes in. So he does whatever he can to keep body and soul together. So he goes on the lecture series. He draws magazine covers. He writes magazine articles. And at one point, Wright was one of the largest collectors of Japanese woodblock prints in the country. And they say if you get your hands on an original, chances are Wright had his hands on it too. Definitely. All right, so he's doing whatever he can to keep body and soul together. Finally, in 1932, his third wife, Oglavana, I said there was a scandal, right? Suggested that he open up a school of architecture and that maybe people would pay him to learn how to be an architect. Well, that's what he does in that very first year, about 23 people pay him $750 a year in the middle of the Great Depression to learn how to be an architect from Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, with Wright, there's always a catch, right? Taliesin is a farm. It's a working farm even today, and it was back then. So that every morning, the students would go out and do whatever needed to be done on the farm. So they would mend the fences, they would milk the cows, they would gather the eggs, whatever needed to be done. And then in the afternoon, they got to go into the drafting room and learn how to be an architect. Pretty cool scam, huh? Have your farm hands pay you, right? <laughs> so that worked out for Wright really well. Um, at this point, he wasn't doing a whole lot of designs, but in 1936, a young newspaper reporter from Madison, Wisconsin, challenged Wright to design a small home for him for $5,000. Well, Wright did the design and the home was built and it came in at $5,500. 
which was the least amount of money that Wright ever went over in his entire career. Because the next year he does a little weekend retreat for the family in Pennsylvania known as Falling Water. That one was supposed to cost $50,000. It wound up costing $175,000. But of course that puts Wright back on top and everybody now wants a Frank Lloyd Wright design. Okay, so that first home was the first of these type homes, the Usonian design. That stands for the United States of North America. And that's because Wright felt that we were unique and special people and we deserved our own architecture, not whatever had washed up from the old shores like Gothic or Italianate or Victorian, he hated all that. Okay, and, and he designs, he's called organic architecture because he designs from nature and with nature. So uh, the floor plans are similar to the uh, prairie styles. There are open floor plans, lots of glass, very bright, very well lit. Uh, Wright is said to be an architect of space and light, definitely. And these homes are smaller and therefore supposed to be more affordable. But of course, with Frank Lloyd Wright, you always put affordable in quotes because you just don't know what his idea of uh, affordable and the client's idea of affordable aren't always the same, definitely. All right, so here we have the Christians. Uh, this is them about 1948. Dr. Christian is on the left. He was a young professor at Purdue University in the School of Architecture, and he was doing something called bionucleonics. Yes, that was an early nuclear pharmacy, okay? So what he would do is he would take uh, a radioactive isotope with a very short half-life, about 14 days, and he would put that in something like an aspirin, and then he'd have somebody swallow it, and then he would follow it through the body with a Geiger counter, see where it went, what broke down, and what came out. Well, now that's part of any drug trial that we have, but back in the 40s, it was unheard of, and people were afraid of nuclear material, so Dr. Christian created a course on the safe handling of nuclear material, taught it to all the relevant departments at Purdue, and eventually went all over the country, all over the world, teaching people how to handle nuclear material safely. He's a pretty cool dude all on his own, and he didn't die until he was 98 years old, so he must have known what he was doing. Well, in 1948, the university had a problem. It was overrun with young single men. And this is because the war has ended and these young men are trying to get their lives back on track by going back to school on the GI Bill. And they overwhelm the university with their numbers. And the university doesn't have enough activities to keep these young men out of trouble. So the university then hires a young woman by the name of Catherine Spooner, went by Kay, from Storm Lake, Iowa, via Columbia University in New York City to become the social director, to come up with more productive activities for these young men to do. So Kay set up a committee and Dr. Christian's dean put him on that committee. Well, he met Kay and Kay met him and it was love at first sight and they were married that very same year, 1948. And when they got together, they talked about what they wanted out of their married lives. And one of the things that kept rising to the top was that they wanted to entertain faculty and staff and students in their home. They wanted to have what was known as salons back in the 50s. So they knew they needed an architect. And they started looking around and they looked up in Chicago and didn't really find anybody up there. But then Dr. Christian went to a conference in New York City, and of course, Mrs. Christian tagged along, right? And she heard about a small community in Pleasantville, New York, called Usonia. And she visited there and she found out that Wright had designed the community, but he also designed three of the homes there. And she happened to visit one and she loved it. She loved it so much, she went and got Dr. Christian, drug him back, and he loved it too. And they left there and they said, well, we'll just get this Frank Lloyd Wright guy, whoever that is, right, to be our architect, no big deal. I love this house. It almost looks like a mushroom, doesn't it? Look at the windows, they're curved at the bottom as well. Pretty cool. All right. So being the academics, whoops, let me go back one. Being the academics that they both were, uh, they started doing a little research about Frank Lloyd Wright and they found out that this may not be so easy after all getting him to be their architect because the 1950s is the busiest decade of Frank Lloyd Wright's almost 72 year career. He is busy doing all the great big civic designs he'd wanted to do all his life. Things like the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. Things like the Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. That's his only skyscraper. Things like the Marin County Civic Center in San Rafael, California. That one looks like a spaceship. Lots of sci-fi movies have, have been filmed there. He was even designing an opera house for a princess in Baghdad. 
It was never built. There was there. There was a coup, but it was built as the Great Agamage Auditorium in Tempe, Arizona. So if you ever get a chance to see that one, check it out. Absolutely. So here's Wright busy doing all these great big civic designs, and we have this young couple, newly married, living where in West Lafayette, Indiana. Who ever heard of that? And they had what Dr. Christian used to say is limited resources. So in other words, they had no money. They were newlyweds, right? So what do you do? Well, one day out of sheer frustration, Dr. Christian just picks up the phone and calls Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And guess who answered the phone? Frank Lloyd Wright. They had a lovely conversation. That conversation ended with an invitation to come up and visit Wright, which they did a couple of weeks later, and at which point, they learned how lucky they were that Wright had answered the phone because if any of the other people that were supposed to answer the phone, answer the phone, they would have said, you are crazy. There is no way Frank Lloyd Wright has time to design a small home for you. Where? So it wouldn't have happened. Fortunately, that was not the case. Now that first meeting was just a get to know you meeting, but Wright set them up with an assignment. He said, come back and tell me what you need in your home, not what you want. That's a very different question, right? So Mrs. Christian was a very detailed woman and she prepared a 26 page typewritten document entitled What We Need for How We Live. It had a table of contents. It had a photograph of Dr. Christian and a biography, a photograph of Mrs. Christian and a biography, a photograph of their daughter, Linda, who at 14 months, of course, didn't have much of a biography yet. So she had a listing of all the various rooms in the house what sort of activities were gonna take place in those rooms, what sort of storage she needed. And she needed storage for pillbox hats and gloves and scarves and formals and tuxedos and china and silver. She also included a topographical map showing the change in elevation from, it's a very uh, slopey, hilly lot. It's got a 14 foot drop from Northwestern Avenue from the uh, top of the driveway down to the bottom, okay? So and she also included a map of all the existing trees on the site, their common name, their scientific name, the diameter of their trunk, and how tall they were. And she also included a panoramic photograph of the, the lot as well. And this was done by taking a photograph and then turning and taking a photograph and then turning. Yeah, not the way we do it now, definitely. All right, so in this uh, book lit that she uh, she wrote, we want a home and a surrounding to have a future, one that will grow with us. And that is exactly what they did. So they worked with Frank Lloyd Wright over a five year period to design their home. And during that five year period, they, they had an agreement with Wright that they could add his detailed plans as they lived in the home because they couldn't afford to make the house look like it does today. They just didn't have the money. So for instance, over here, this is the Samara dining room table and chairs. It came in in 1989, okay? It took that long to find somebody who would do it. Uh, this is the copper fascia around the roof line here. See the dimensional aspects of it? That one didn't come in until 1992. There's a rug. The Samara rug didn't come in until 1994. So they worked with Wright over that period and they got to meet with him over the five year period several times a year. Um, and they would, they would talk about the design of the home and then they would stay for lunch or dinner. And often they also got to stay the night at both Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin and Taliesin West in Scottsdale, Arizona. So they had a lovely relationship with Mr. Wright. All right, so one of the meetings they had, Wright asked them, he said, do you like evergreens? And Dr. Krishnan said, yes, we love evergreens. As a matter of fact, I have a little evergreen nursery down in the valley where I'll plant little seedlings. And when they get to be about four feet tall, I'll move them out on the lot. And that's how Dr. Christian was landscaping before Wright got a hold of it. What you need to understand is Wright did everything at this house. He did the design of the home. He did the interior design. And what he didn't design himself, he specified. And he also did the landscape design. So he controlled the complete environment. But the most amazing thing of all is the Christians did what he told them to do. They did it over time, but they still did it. So um, these are the wing seats that are inside pine cones. So right at another meeting, he asked them, he said, do you know the word Samara? And the Christians said, no, they didn't know that word. He said, well, you better look it up because it's gonna be the name of your new home. And he said that to him twice, and they thought he wasn't gonna tell him what it meant, but eventually he did. And these are those little wing seats. It's a botanical term. Okay. All right, so I know we've seen these before. This is a maple seed. I have a little video here I want to share with you. Did I get that off? Okay. Oh, 
Okay. So the wing seats and the maple cone, uh, the pine cones do the same thing as the maple seats. They twirl around like that. And Wright, of course, knew that. And he knew that they were in pine cones. And he knew that the Christians loved pine cones, evergreen trees. So Wright sees that wing seat spinning around. And he does an artistic abstraction of what he sees. And that becomes the motif for the house. OK, then he varies that design. And he puts it all over the house. It's in the perforated boards. It's in the, ca the carpet. It's in the. Um, the furniture design, it's all over. It's in that copper fascia, the dimensional aspect of the copper fascia. It's all over. Okay, so construction began on April 1st, 1955. They moved in on September 7th, 1956. It took 18 months for construction and for eight of the critical months, Wright had one of his apprentices on site living in West Lafayette for, for eight months during that critical stage of construction. So whenever any problems or questions arose, he could get in touch with Mr. Wright and they would solve the problem. And this is the young man right here. He happened to be Ed Kipta. He also happened to be a Mason and laid most of the brickwork which was pretty fortunate. So of course, this is what the house looked like when they first moved in. Notice there's no copper fascia around there. All right. Now it's all grown up around it. It's really... So the home is built on a grid and you can see that grid scored right into the concrete here. Uh, Wright would design, almost all of the Usonians were designed on a grid uh, and the grid varied. It just depended on what sort of a design he was making. So he would do a circle like in the Sol Friedman house or a square, or a diamond, or a triangle, or a hexagon, all kinds of different shapes. And those, that grid then influences the, the home, okay, the design of the home. So for instance, uh, we have the four foot square grid, and you can see it's scored right here into the concrete. That's way all the way through the house. It's that way, it even goes outside onto the lanai out here. So our perforated boards are four feet wide. Okay, the lights in the deck are four feet apart. The curtains hang every four feet. That's because the plate glass windows are four feet wide. Um, the trellis is four feet. The support of the trellis are four feet, is four feet. The slot windows are four feet apart. The lights in the bookshelves are four feet apart. The cushions in the, in, the, in the banquette are four feet wide as well. Okay, so this is what it looked like early on. So these are the lights in the bookshelves. These shine up and down. These are the curtains that are four feet, I mean, the um, cushions that are four feet wide. Here's another shot from that 1956 when they first moved in. These are the, tri these are triangular, I'm going to tell you a story a little bit later. These are the triangular tables and these are the stack tables back here, okay? And there's the curtains and there's the lights in the deck. All right, since I can't show you the actual house, I'm going to tell you some stories. So the Christians picked up their plans from Frank Lloyd Wright on, ja on January 1st, 1955. And uh, Mrs. Christian brought along Frank's, Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography to get, a, get him to autograph it for her. And so when she asked him, he took the book and he said, I don't know why these people want these autographs. I never ask anybody for an autograph. You know, and so he opens the book up and he sees this page here on the left. And he says, I don't know why the editors put that there. It's a waste of paper. paper. He just, they just wasted that space. So he grabs a hold of the a page and he rips it out and he throws it in the garbage can. Well, you can imagine he had their attention, definitely. And then he proceeds to sign the next page in his red square to the Christians. New Year's Day, Taliesin, 1955, Frank Lloyd Wright. They were at Taliesin West. I guess he just forgot to put that in. So when Mrs. Christian recovered, she said, Mr. Wright, can I have that page back? And he said, well, of course you can. And he gave it back to her, you know, gave her the book. And um, then they went about going over the plans and, um, uh, you know, figured out what to do next. But then about, oh, I'd say 30 years ago, Dr. Christian was up um, at, at the Getty uh, Museum in, New in um, LA. And he was getting a copy of all of his correspondence with Frank Lloyd Wright. And he was waiting for his appointment and he noticed there were bookshelves and he looked on the bookshelves and he saw there were books on there and he noticed there was one of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography. And he opened it up and he noticed that that page was missing, that he had done that to somebody else. He'd torn that page out. Can you imagine? I, I, I can't, no. Another um, story I'm going to tell you is about... Um, they often had parties. Mrs. Christian loved to um, entertain, and she was excellent at it. She would um, make her own invitations. Uh, sometimes she would 
uh, roll them up and put them in little capsules that look like pills, you know, that because he was a pharmacist, right? Uh, she one time she blew up balloons and wrote the Im imitation on the on the balloon and then let the air out and put it in an envelope and sent that off. But that was the least well attended um, party because people didn't think to blow up the balloon. They just thought, <laughs> yeah. So one time she had a party and so she took those six stacked uh, those six triangular tables that I showed you earlier and she put those all around so people would have places to put things. And then she took this copper pot here and she put it in front of the sofa, okay? And she filled it with water and she put fish in it. Okay, so it's a living, moving centerpiece, which is pretty cool. So she, um, takes the stack tables and stacks them on top of each other and on the top table she had uh, the appetizers uh, and the middle table she had the finger food which was probably pimento cheese sandwiches with the crust cut off right and on the bottom she had the desserts and the desserts were very often petty fours that she had made and decorated herself yes so she had invited president hubdi and his wife along with other people including her roommate from college who had uh who also owned a frank lloyd wright designed home in okamish okamish michigan so um she, they all got there and the, the Hufti's come in. He's retired by now. And Mrs. Hufti is a little older and um, having trouble with vision and hearing. So she hobbles down the stairs and goes over and sits on the sofa. And she puts her purse on what she thinks is a glass covered coffee table. Well, it's swimming with the fishes, right? So of course you could imagine Mrs. Christian was absolutely mortified, probably wanted to crawl under the house. She uh, has every, every edition of Emily Post etiquette books over on the bookshelf. So you could imagine she was just mortified. But it turned out that it was a canvas purse and it only had a lipstick in it. Thank God no iPhone, right? So it didn't really hurt anything at all. It was dry by the time they left, as a matter of fact, yeah. All right, so this again is what the house looked like in 1956. And here we are with it currently, almost from the same location. See how grown up it's gotten? It's amazing. Here we are in the living room. There are the perforated boards that are four feet wide, the lights on the deck that are four feet apart, the curtains hanging every four feet. These are those stack tables. This is, I mean, these are the triangle tables. This is the stack tables here. These are hassocks. You can move those hassocks all around. Here's the Samara rug here. Here we are on the outside. Copper fascia. Here's another shot of the living room. Again, these are the stack tables over here. You can put them on top of each other. They look like a pagoda. Triangle tables here. Lights in the bookshelves. And here's the entryway. Um, and here it is like in 1957 with Mrs. Christian and her daughter, Linda. I love how he framed, this is the Dragon Crest Garden back here. And he frames the garden with the um, carport, which is pretty cool. And there we are again. Um, I wanted to tell you something else. I can't remember what it was. Okay, we have house tours, arboretum tours, exhibits, a book, a documentary, and archives. Uh, we have between two and 3,000 people a year through the house. Well, we did. <laughs> we don't have anybody through the house now. Um, we, could ha we can have up to about 35 is what I'm comfortable with. The living room was originally designed to seat 50 people. Uh, and so there's this long banquet here and the banquet turns the corner. Let's see if I can go back and show you that better. There, this banquet here, it sits about 15 people. Um, 15 adults, fairly comfortably. We have, oops, sorry. I'm having trouble with this thing, sorry. We have uh, the overstuffed chairs and sofa. We have 12 of these hassocks, and like I said, you can move those all around and people can sit everywhere. We have six of these tables that can come apart and can also be used as seats. And then there's a hexagonal table over at the other side of the sofa where you can uh, use that as a seat as well. But the really smart thing he did, eh. 
Ah, oh, you can't really see it anywhere, sorry. Is he lowered the, the floor? Ah, oh, there it is. He lowered the floor so there's steps. So if you wanted to, you could sit on the steps. And a lot of time when they had um, the salons, the college students would sit on the steps. And even in the wintertime, that's a wonderful place to sit because embedded in the concrete floors are copper pipes and you run hot water through those pipes and it heats like a rock in the sun. Absolutely the most wonderful heat ever. Okay, let's try to get back. All right. Uh, in 2015, Samara was de de des designated a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest designation conferred by the National Park Service on places of extraordinary, nary, or extraordinary national significance. Samara now stands among an elite group of 42 places in Indiana and almost 2,600 in the United States to carry the National Historic Landmark designation. Um, in 1992, Dr. Christian set up a trust, and, this, and uh, the trust is to maintain and protect the home uh, and to make the home available to visitors for education and enjoyment uh, through group tours and private study. Um, also, to um, get out the information about the historical significance of the home and the important contributions made by Frank Lloyd Wright to Indiana and American architecture. Right, uh, there were eight Frank Lloyd Wright designed homes in Indiana. Uh, two were in Gary, one of those burned down. There's still one there, it's a prairie style. There are two in uh, South Bend, a prairie and a Usonian. There's one in Fort Wayne, it's a Usonian. There's one in Marion and, and it is a Usonian as well. And it can be stayed overnight, I'm pretty sure, and then us. So in 2018, Linda Christian Davis, Dr. Christian's daughter, turned the house over to the John he, John he Christian Family Memorial Trust, which is held and co-stewarded by in Indiana Landmarks, the largest historic preservation organization in the country. We are very fortunate to have that relationship with them. They have incredibly knowledgeable people there. Um, thank you. That's all I've got. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. We do. We do have some questions. Um, so th does anyone live in the house right now? Nope. No, they don't. It is a house museum and strictly for tours and nobody sleeps over there or anything like that. Uh, let's see. Should I, I stop see. sharing? You, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. So someone didn't tell him that everything needed to be six feet apart, not four feet apart when he designed the house for COVID practices, right? <laughs> that would have been great. He'd do that today for sure. <laughs> so if anyone has questions, please type them into the chat box and I'll be happy to um, ask them. What's the different, are there different types of houses? You, you mentioned Usonian. Yeah. And so is that one type of Frank Lloyd Wright house or? Yes. Yes, Wright, Wright did uh, several different designs. So he did um, what he called the American system built homes. And those were like a kit, like sort of like the Sears uh, uh, houses, you know, the Sears catalog houses, only these were pre-cut, okay? Not pre-manufactured, okay? So you got all the pieces and then you had to have a contractor to put it together. So that's one type of home he did. It did the prairie style home, which you guys should all be pretty familiar with if you're in the Chicago area, because um, those are the big homes that he designed that were very different from Victorian styles. They are more horizontal and closer to the earth. Um, and then he also did another kind of prefab house later on in the 50s, and then the Usonians. And the Usonians, like I said, were in a direct contrast to the things like the Gothic and the Italianate and the Victorian styles that he just didn't like at all, not at all. Um, I just totally lost my train of thought. There you go. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, after the Christians lived in the house, did anybody else live in the house after them or they were the only people? They were the only people uh, with their daughter, Linda. Um, and like I said, so Mrs. Christian died in 1986. And then Dr. Christian lived there until 2015 uh, when he passed away on his 98th birthday, right in the home. So he lived there all that time. He did, he loved so it. Was, was he um, ambulatory? 
some of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses are not handicap accessible. We certainly were. He was he was ambulatory until the very, very end. And then he was in a wheelchair and it was one of those really little ones like you take on airplanes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so that was that was how he was able to get get around. How did you get interested in um, Frank Lloyd Wright? What is your background? Um, I used to teach English as a second language, okay, to adults. And one year we had a number of Asian students and we had heard that the home had an Asian feel to it. Wright told the Christians, your home will have an Asian feel just by design. So when you add accent pieces, they should be of an oriental nature. Happened to be what they liked, he knew that. So um, I took my students, my class to visit the home. It's always good for them to hear somebody else speak English, right? And I, I met Dr. Christian and I fell in love with him and I fell in love with the house and I just said, you know, can I move in? And he said, no. <laughs> so he said, but I can always use another interpreter. And so I became what, what he called those interpreters. He didn't like the word docents. And he said that the house is a work of art and you interpret a work of art. So that's how I got involved. And then we worked together on lots of special events. I am um, we did his 50th anniversary together. It was a whole year of, of special events. And so we really got to know each other and found that we thought a lot alike about everything. So then he started sort of grooming me to take over for him after he decided to retire. So did, did Frank Lloyd Wright name other houses? Why, why Samara? What was it about the we call them helicopters. They land on our yes. patio, you know, once the trees come out on our on our tree. Yes. But um, what's the significance of that? Well, they like the evergreen trees and Wright always likes to design from nature. So he would pick something on the lot often that the client liked and then he would make that the motif of the house. So there's the hollyhock house out in California. That one um, is um, the hollyhock design and he abstracts that one too. Uh, Dana Thomas has the sumac but Dana Thomas I don't think got a name. There's wings bread in um, uh, Racine, Wisconsin and that one was named for the birds, uh, the, wings, the wingspan of the birds. Um, there's still been in um, Two Rivers, Wisconsin and that is by the river. It's on a bend in the river. I, I, I'm blanking on others. There's a million of them. And, and if anybody's watching this that knows me, they're going to chew me out for not mentioning their house. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a question. Is there a relationship in place with Purdue University? No, not at all. Um, I mean, we have students come and classes come and professors come. We have that interaction, but we're in no way associated with Purdue at all. Um, are there any other questions? I was super fast, man. Yeah, no. So I did, we did get a question um, asking what is hanging behind you, which I asked you before we actually came on live. So do you want to share what that is? Your, I don't, what was it? I forgot. Your tapestry behind you. All right, yes. All right, let me get closer to it. Oh. Do I still have you guys? You do. Okay, wait a second. I lost you. Okay. So this is a, a quilt that was done by a friend of mine. It's the Roby House design. Yeah, it's quite nice. She's very talented. <laughs> okay, last call for questions. I don't see anything coming up in the chat. This was delightful. I do want to remind everybody that we will have a visit to Dana Thomas House on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we are going to Burnham Block. So we hope you'll join us for this continued exploration of Frank Lloyd Wright. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.